יותר אם היינו בקמפוס מול המסעדות הסגורות. So I switch to English. Uh, we have two lectures this uh, afternoon from the younger generation of uh, scholars. Before giving them the word, I would like to steal two minutes to say something about, um, uh, about Shabtai in a way. So uh, I've known Shabtai uh, now for almost 40 years. For many years, we would sit next to each other at the research seminar and share share with each other, and often also with the public, critical comments on the lecture that had just been delivered. I suspect that at some point we deserved the title given, given to us by the former secretary of the Institute. And to help you with this, just a second. Okay. Oh, oh. I was warned before that I should look to it that I have only one, one uh, window open, but I didn't endorse it. So I will not share the, I will not uh, share the picture with you. I'll simply share with you what the, um, what the name was that Anatsion gave uh, Shabtai and me, and this was two grumpy old men from the Muppet Show. This was the public side of our relationship. The less public side of our friendship were weekly meetings filled with discussions of history, literature, and philosophy, and of course, also personal matter. For some years, the, scholar the scholarly discussion had a firm structure. I would send Shabtai an historical philosophical text concerning mathematics or a draft or something I was writing in this area, and we would then thoroughly discuss it. In, nine, in 2006, I published a preprint of a lengthy study with the title Definition and Construction, Salomon Maimon's Philosophy of Geometry, and I would like to share with you the first footnote. It reads as follows. The work on this essay began in weekly meetings with my colleague and friend, Shabtai Unguru. Besides talking about everything between heaven and earth, we also read texts of Maimon and discussed my interpretation of them. Shabtai also commented on my first extensive uh, draft of this study. Without his wide knowledge of the history of mathematics, his uncompromising acumen and his encouragement, this essay would not have been written. Let me conclude with an apology. 10 years ago, as a gift for his 80th birthday, I promised Chabtai to dedicate to him my planned book on Maimon. The promise was made in good faith, but God or fate had uh, different plans with me. On my way, I discovered Moses Mendelssohn's semiotic analysis of religious practices and disappeared from my Maimon studies for almost eight years. After the publication of the book that resulted from my religious studies, I returned to Maimon and I still hope to put someday the first copy of the book promised on Shabtai's desk, of course, with the dedication to him. So thank you, Shabtai, for many years of a close friendship and to be continued. I will now turn to um, the two lectures we have on our program. The first will be by Orna Harari. Orna is um, on the faculty of both the Department of Philosophy and of Classics. At present, she's chair of the department of the letter department. Her research areas are ancient logic, philosophy of mathematics, and Aristotle's natural philosophy, as well as a tradition of commentaries in late antiquity. Her book, Knowledge and Demonstration, Aristotle's Posterior Analytic, was published by Springer in 2004, and it was republished in paperback in 2010. 
Her most recent publication is a study titled Contig Contiguity, Continuity, Oh God, and Continuous Change, Alexander of Aphrodisias on Aristotle. It appeared in uh, a book, The History of Continua, Philosophical and Mathematical Perspective uh, with Oxford in 2020. Orna, go ahead with your talk. The title, I may say, is Can Aristotle Explain Why Distance Affects Our Vision? Thank you, Gidon, for the introduction. And uh, as Leo said, it's too early to look at the past and uh, share memories about Shabtai. Uh, we have another 30 years, at least, to, to do it. So I here I just wish Shabtai happy and healthy many returns and happy birthday. And I thank him for 25 years of friendship and for his unwavering support. Today, I take the risk of giving Shabtai a yet another opportunity to deem a question that I ask a klotzkasche. If anyone has doubts about the meaning of the term, it means foolish question. And hope that I succeed in convincing him and a fortiori anyone else that the question whether Aristotle can explain why distance affects our vision was an examination. So I start with a justification of the question. And why does the question arise? In the passage from the census six that uh, you see on the screen, Aristotle asks whether like order and sound or their effects, visible objects and light, light reach a middle point before they reach the sense organ. This aporia complements Aristotle's discussion of vision in the sense of two, whereas there he rejects the view that vision is caused by fire or a visual ray that travels from the eyes to remote visible objects, here he raises a question regarding theories that reverse the direction of influence by assuming either that visual objects themselves, or as he himself holds, the changes that they cause travel to the eyes, asking whether these changes are temporal. In so doing, he reconsiders his rejection in the Anima 27 of Empedocles' view, that light travels and is present at the given moment between the atmosphere and the earth, presenting three arguments in favor of the view that the propagation of light and visible objects effects on the medium are temporal changes. The third argument, and this is the number two on this uh, slide, it turns on distances effect on vision. It is based on Aristotle's view that perception in general and vision in particular belong to the category of relatives but, but here it features as an unwelcome consequence of the possibility that the propagation of light and color's effect on the medium are not temporal changes. By this argument, an approval of this possibility entails that a perceiver sees and a visible object is seen merely by virtue of their being somehow related to each other. Accordingly, it fails to account for the difference between the relation of the seer and the visible, visible objects that requires them to be, to be located somewhere, and the relation between equal things which hold regardless of their position and distance from one another. This argument highlights the consequences of a negative answer to the question whether the propagation of light and visible objects effect on the medium are temporal changes. It shows that in rejecting Empedocles' view that light travels on the grounds that it is unreasonable that a motion that traverses a vast distance from, the ex from extreme east to extreme west is unobserved, Aristotle exposes himself to the no less worrying objection that visible objects' position and distance from the perceiver do not affect their perception. Considering that in this aporia, Aristotle ultimately argues that vision is not a temporal change, the question whether we can counter this objection and explain why distance affects our vision arises. The next paragraph of Aristotle's discussion of this aporia gives the misleading impression that he does counter this objection. Here he explains why sounds and odors are perceived differently by nearby and distant perceivers. He says that although sound and odor and their, med uh, and their media are continuous, their motion is divided, that is take place part by part, and argues that for this reason, nearby and distant perceivers in a sense hear and, in, and smell and uh, the same thing, and in a sense do not. 
Here it does not clarify this conclusion, but immediately addresses a related aporia regarding whether different perceivers can hear, smell, and see the same object. In reply to this aporia, he says that different perceivers perceive the numerically identical object that initiated the process of perception, for example, the bell, the frankincense, or the fire, but numerically different special objects, sounds, odors, and colors. At first glance, it is natural to understand this reply as a clarification of the claim that nearby and distant perceivers in a sense hear and smell the same thing and in a sense do not. But on closer examination, this understanding is problematic. It fails to notice that this reply and the related aporia address different questions and have different scopes of applications. The former refers specifically to hearing and smell and asks why nearby and proximate perceivers have different perceptions of the same object. And the latter refers to all distal senses, including vision, and asks how several perceivers can perceive the same object. The significance of, the dif of this difference becomes clear from the following considerations. Aristotle's contention that different perceivers perceive numerically different special objects is a response to thinkers who argue that several perceivers cannot perceive the same thing on the ground that one body cannot be present in the different places where several perceivers are located without being separated from itself. To counter this argument, Aristotle needs to show that the assumption that different perceivers perceive the same thing does not entail that the thing is separated from itself because the perceivers are not affected by the same body but by numerically different instantiations of its perceptible qualities in different places. The notion of numerical difference that suffices to establish this conclusion is a weak notion whereby the special objects that affect each perceiver are spatially different instantiations of the same perceptible quality. By this notion, but this notion is insufficient for answering the question why nearby and distant perceivers perceive the same object differently. Aiming to explain how several perceivers can perceive the same thing, it does not account for the differences in, perce in the perceived content. For example, the different difference between the distorted phoneme that a distant perceiver hears and the accurate phoneme that a nearby perceiver does. In view of this difficulty, it is reasonable to assume that if Aristotle answers this question through the notion of numerical difference, he does so through a stronger notion that implies that each perceiver perceives specifically identical but qualitatively different spatial objects. These considerations do not clarify how Aristotle's answers, the above two questions, how Aristotle's answers to the above two questions should be interpreted. They merely highlight the differences between these questions, thereby suggest, su suggesting that Aristotle's mention of vision in his discussion of the related ap aporia does not imply that like sounds and others, visible objects are perceived dif differently by nearby and distant perceivers. From the discussion of these questions, we can only learn that nearby and distant perceivers in a sense hear and smell different objects because sounds and others motion through the medium takes place part by part. Regarding vision, this discussion leaves two possibilities open. In one, visible objects position and distance do not, do not affect a visual perception because they change the medium at one go. And in the other, they affect visual perception, but not for the same reason that position and distance affect hearing and smelling. In what follows, I argued for the second possibility, B on the screen, showing the differences in visual perception caused by distance and position result not from changes that visible objects undergo in the course of their transmission to the sense organ, but from changes that the medium undergoes. In the Generazione Animalium 5.1, Aristotle explains uh, seeing at the, at the distance as follows. And this is a quotation uh, from, this, from this passage. The position of the eyes is the cause of seeing at the distance and of the arrival of the motion of our visible objects. Animals whose eyes are prominent are not far sighted, whereas those whose eyes lie inside the cavity see at the distance because the motion is not dispersed in the open, but goes in a straight course. For it makes no difference if we say, as certain people do, that vision is due to a visual rays going out. For if there is nothing before the eyes, less visual ray necessarily falls upon visible objects, 
because the visu visual ray is dispersed and sees distant objects to a lesser extent. Or that seeing is due to motion from visible objects because it is similarly necessary that vision sees by motion. Distant objects would be seen best if there were something straight and continuous like a tube from vision, where by vision obviously means the eyes, uh, to the seen object. So then the motion from the seen objects would not be dispersed. But if this is impossible, it is necessary that the farther the tube-like thing extends, the more accurate the seeing of distant object is. Although here Aristotle clearly states that regardless of its direction, motion for visible objects or of the visual ray, opsis, is essential for explaining vision, this passage paves the way to understanding how we can explain differences in vision owing to position and distance within the framework of the present aporia, which denies that visible objects travel or cause a temporal change in the medium. The claim that the visual ray theory and its alternative are equivalent for explanatory purposes is found in three other passages in Aristotle's writings, in the Kylo 2.8, in Meteorologica 3.4, and 3.6. But this passage differs from the, other, uh, the others in one crucial respect. The explanatory model found in the other passages is more economic than the above explanation in accounting for visible objects' visibility as well as for their mediation through the eyes to the same process. For example, by this explanatory model, the fixed stars appear to quiver either because the visual ray weakens in the course of its travel from the eye to the stars, or because the object's effect weakens in the course of its travel to the eye. In both explanations, the factor that accounts for the visibility of the objects and the factor that facilitates the mediation and thus explains why nearby and distant objects appear differently are identical. It is a certain motion, either of the visual ray or of the effect that visible, visible objects cause. In the above passage, Aristotle adds another explanatory factor, arguing that accurate vision at the distance also requires a tube-like, continuous, and straight thing that prevents the dispersal of the visual ray or the motion that comes from the visible objects. In the Anima 3.2, he develops this idea further, thereby undermining the explanatory worth of the visual ray theory. An air is moved to the greatest extent and it acts and is being acted upon whenever it remains and is one. For this reason, it is better to say regarding reflection that the air undergoes change by shapes and colors as long as it remains one than to say that the visual ray that goes out from the eye is reflected and the air is one on a smooth surface. For this reason, the air moves vision in turn just as, an, as if an impression in wax were to go through up to the limit. Whereas in the Generazione Corruzione 5.1, Aristotle explains the transmission of visual objects and accurate seeing at the distance in terms of both the motion that this object cause and the condition that prevents the dispersal, here he appeals only to the condi condition that facilitates the transmission of the object's effect to the sense organ, which identifies with the unity of the air. This condition of the air plays the role of the tube-like thing, deep eye sockets and walls of pits and wells that in the Generazione Animalium 5.1 account for seeing at a distance. It explains how visible objects effects are transmitted to the eye because as Aristotle says here, when the air is one, it can be affected by visible objects and can affect in turn the eye as if these objects were impressions that penetrate a bulk of wax up to its limit. Aristotle claims that the air is one on a smooth surface, suggests that visible objects cause this, this condition. According to the sensu three, color is the limit of the surface of the transparent inhering in solid bodies. And according to the anima three, color is on the surface of that which is visible, I quote, in itself, but not by definition. The qualification not by definition clarifies how visible objects cause this condition. It implies that they do not they do so not by virtue of being colors, but by virtue of being attributes of solid bodies bounded by surfaces. Correspondently, this qualification implies that air undergoes the change caused by this object, not by virtue of being the medium of vision, that is by virtue of being transparent, but by virtue of being air. 
So understood, the theory of vision of the de anima and the sensu differs from the visual ray theory, not only in reversing the direction of interaction between the object and the eye, but also in dissociating the account of the transmission of visible objects effects from the account for the, of, the, of the visibility. By this understanding, the air is affected by visible objects in two ways, by virtue of being air and by virtue of being transparent. The former effect accounts for visible object transmission. It is a change of air as air that bodies caused by virtue of being solid when they unify uh, the air. The latter effect accounts for visibility. It is the change that bodies as colored bring about in the air as transparent. In the Generazione Animalium 5.1, where Aristotle discusses visible objects and light effects on the eyes, he draws this distinction. He says that the eyes are affected by visible objects and light, both as liquid and as transparent. He identifies vision with the latter and appeals to the former in explaining sharp-sightedness. For example, dark eyes are less sharp-sighted at night because the weak nocturnal light does not sufficiently move the large quantities of liquid in them, which like liquids in general are hard to move at night. This discussion lends support to the above interpretation and illustrates how the theory of vision of the de anima and the sensu can explain farsightedness. Analogously to the distinction between the two ways in which the eyes are affected, the distinction between the change that the air undergoes as air and the change that it undergoes as transparent can provide Aristotle with the means of explaining differences in visual perception caused by distance and position within the theoretical framework that rejects the view that visible objects travel or cause temporal change. We can regard these differences as resulting not from changes of the visible object's effect on air as transparent, but from changes of the condition of air as air that facilitates the transmission of visible object's effects, that is, its unity. By this explanation, the fixed stars appears to quiver, appear to quiver not because the visual ray is weakened or because their effect as visible object diminishes, but because the air between us and the stars, the stars gradually loses its unity. Similarly, a distant perceiver does not see the visible object that a nearby perceiver sees, not because the color or its effect do, do not reach the former perceiver, but because the air surrounding this perceiver is no longer unified. This explanatory model does not hold for sound and odor. According to the Anima 2.8, sound is the motion of the air when something prevents it from being dispersed. Therefore, a change of this condition of the air results in a change of sound and not only in a change of the medium through which it is perceived. Similarly, according to the Sensu 5, Odor is the effect of the flavor dry on air on, uh, or air or water is moist. Therefore, a change of air's moistness results in a change of odor and not only in the change of the medium. By contrast, color, color is an attribute of the visible object itself. It is the limit or surface of the transparent inhering in solid bodies. And its effect on the medium is different from the effect that facilitates it med its mediation. Therefore, a change in air's or water's unity does not result in a change of color, but in a change of its appearance. This difference clarifies why in his discussion of the related aporia, Aristotle argues that different perceivers hear, smell, and also see numerically different perceptible objects. Um, um, but he mentions only sounds and others in a reply to the question why nearby and distant perceivers have different perceptions. It shows that the explanation that Aristotle offers in this reply does not hold for vision, because in this case, different perceivers see the same color under different conditions, whereas in the case of hearing and smelling, different perceivers hear and smell different sounds and odors. This is, that is to say, different conditions of the air. In both cases, perception varies according to the distance between the perceiver and the object, but for different reasons. In the case of hearing and smelling, perception varies because sound and odor or the effects undergo change in the course of the transmission to the sense organ. But in the case of vision, the air undergoes change with respect to its, uni its unity, but colors remain unchanged. This interpretation also shows that the contention that visible objects do not travel or cause a temporal change in the medium is compatible 
with Aristotle's claim that the change that the medium of perception undergoes is an alteration. It shows that the denial that the propagation of light and the effect of colored bodies on the transparent medium are alteration does not imply that the process of vision does not involve alteration at all. This denial holds for the alteration of the medium as transparent caused by colored bodies as colored. But the change that the air undergoes as air caused by colored bodies as bodies is an alteration. This explanation finds support in the fact that Aristotle describes the medium's change as an alteration, specifically in contexts where he accounts for the transmission of perceptible objects to the senses. In the sense of two, the claim, this claim is presented as an alternative to the view that, it is, that uh, uh, perception is or vision is caused by a visual way that issues from the eye. In the Anima 312, he argues that perception at a distance is possible because alteration is analogous to locomotion in passing through the medium by successive stages of, of change. In On Dreams 2, he makes the same claim. And in Physics 7 2, he argues that all types of alteration, those caused by perceptible objects included, the uh, that in all these types, the first agent and the last patient are in contact because they are, they are continuous with the air. Colors are continuous with light and light with vision. Consequently, Arthur's rejection of Empedocles' view that light travels in the medium led him to reject the view that visible objects travel, travel to the eyes, but it does not leave him with no means of explaining differences in vision caused by distance and uh, position. In the Granazzone Animalium uh, 5.1 and in the Anima 3.2, he presents in a nutshell an explanatory model that can account for these differences to the distinction between the effect on air as air and the effect on air as transparent. This model is a far cry from geometrical optics, but it uh, preserves the explanatory advantages of the visual way theory that Aristotle abounded in his psychological writings. Period? Period, yes. Thank you, Orna. Uh, we have some time for questions. Who wants to go first? There are two natural candidates, one who deals with optics and the other who deals with Aristotle. OK. Perhaps we'll have after our second lecture another opportunity to return to this one when people have digested what they have just heard and came up with, uh, with questions. So if there are no present questions, I'll turn to our second talk by Raz Chen Maurice. Raz is an historian of early modern science and his main publications are Baroque Science, which he co-authored with Offergal, and Measuring Shadows, Kepler's Optics of Invisibility. Currently, he is an academic director of the Martin Buber Society of Fellows and teaches at the Department of History at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Raz will speak on From Renaissance Shadows to Baroque Refractions, reading Kepler's Diopteris. Raz. Thank you. Thank you, Gidon. And uh, it's a very exciting uh, day and moment. And it reminds me really, does it like uh, already lay or kind of retrieve the history of uh, the celebrations for Shabtai? But 30 years ago, when we celebrated these 60, Yes, the best day, and uh, there, there was an international workshop. I was then at the end of my master's under Shabtai uh, and Rivka, and uh, it was my first academic conference to participate in, and obviously the first international conference, so I was quite excited. And Shabtai kind of uh, the day before, or in the morning, can't remember exactly, told me, look, there's nothing to be excited, don't be so stressed. Uh, the people there either didn't read what you're working on, or if they read, it was so many years ago, they probably forgot. So you are the expert, just go out there and do it. And I uh, kind of, uh, uh, since then, uh, kind of took this advice in many moments of uh, 
uh, shaky self-confidence, and uh, sometimes I even tell it to my students today. Uh, so that's one thing that I kind of uh, very thankful to Shabtai. But the other things which are maybe a little bit more uh, important than this advisor's advice uh, is uh, that I learned from Shabtai to be sensitive to the nuances of mathematical texts, to, um, to read through the opacity of diagrams and geometrical demonstrations, and to kind of see the underlying epistemological and ontological assumptions that uh, form these texts and form these uh, worlds of ideas, and to kind of try and create an historical treatment of mathematical texts, which is not an easy task uh, at all. So today I'm going to use this uh, tool uh, I acquired in my years of studying with Shabtai and suggest a new reading uh, of the transformation of Kepler's optics from its 1604 camera obscura based version to its 1611 the optiche based on his uh, recent observations through the telescope. So uh, thank you Shabtai and Happy birthday, and hopefully, as everybody said, in the next 10, 20 years, I hope I will still be around to celebrate uh, meaningfully this, uh, this occasion. So I'll just share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Kepler's excitement on hearing the news of Galileo's telescopic observation and the novel discoveries and appearances in the heavens is well documented. Kepler himself testified on his almost ecstatic reactions to this historical moment. Johann Matthäus uh, Wackhoff of Wackenfels, the illustrious uh, counsel, counselor of his uh, sacred imperial majesty and referendary of the sacred imperial holy council, told me the story from his carriage in front of my house. Intense ast astonishment seized me as I weighed this uh, very strange pronouncement. Our emotions were strongly aroused. He was so overcome with joy by the news, I with shame, both of us with laughter, that he scarcely managed, that we scarcely managed to talk and I to listen. Uh, these mixed emotions of exhilaration and shame ran through the entire open letter Kepler wrote in response to Galileo's Siderius Nonsius. Galileo's new discoveries were obviously a great asset to the Copernican cause, but also, and that was the reason Wacker was who dubbed with a Korean philosophy was laughing, a support for G uh, Giordano Bruno type uh, plurality of worlds, uh, uh, undermining uh, Kepler's uh, staunch belief in a geometrically ordered universe. If four planets have either to been concealed up there, what stop us from believing that countless others will be hereafter discovered in the same region? Or as Democritus and Leop uh, Leocippus taught and among the moderns Bruno and Bruce, there is an infinite number of other worlds. Furthermore, these sensational the observations shed negative light on Kepler's use of the five platonic solids as an explanation for the existence of only six planets. Uh, therefore, I besought myself how there could be any increase in the number of the planets without harm to my cosmographical mystery. In that book, Euclid, uh, five solids permit no more than six planets around the sun. Another crucial of Kepler's intellectual and ease was concerned, however, with the telescope as an optical instrument. As a severe critic of sense perception, Kepler presented his new science as, a, <clears throat> as an endeavor established by a priori reasoning, as a science without hypothesis. In order to supplement this a priori procedure, Kepler devised his new optics, established, establishing it on the camera obscura as an artificial instrument that can reduce celestial phenomena to a mathematically quantifiable game of light, light stains and shadows. In order to vouchsafe these uh, instrumentally based observation from charges of being reduced to mere fantastically manipulated images, Kepler attempted to anchor them as concrete material appearances. 
the axis of his analysis of sight is his bold differentiation between pictures and images, establishing the first as physically real, concretized by a screen or a wall, while denigrating the other, the images, to the level of mental fabrication, though fashioned by rational calculations. The new manner of producing images through a telescope unstabilized this contracted differentiation, underwriting Kepler's implicit suggestion that all visual experience is the result of systems of refraction. The telescopic image are now the attempt to save visual experience by emphasizing the materiality of the screen on which the image appear. The images streaming through the telescope could be projected in midair with the same result as when projected on a material screen or impressed on the retina. In a long and detailed paragraph, Kepler attempts to reduce the telescopic imaging to a long tradition of various applications of lenses for enlarging distant objects and correcting eyesight. Kepler especially emphasized the Laporta's discussions of enlarging very distant objects in an attempt to show that this application was on the horizons of optical practice before Galileo. The purpose of this detailed enumeration of Galileo's precursors is not to undermine Galileo's originality or to degrade his achievement, claims that Kepler makes a point to reject at the outset, but to obliterate any difference between the epistemological status of an image formed through a system of consisting of one lens and a system of multiple lenses. This is most conspicuous in when Kepler refers the reader to a diagram in his treatise on optics from 1604. Um, yeah, that's... Whoever look at the diagram understand immediately that it is not a depiction of a system of two lenses. Yeah, that's what Kepler says in 1611, in 1610. Look at this diagram from page 202 and you'll see a telescope. You see a concave and convex lenses, one on top of the other, and that's, everybody can see it's a telescope, which obviously it's not. Uh, it's, uh, but only a printing accident when two separate diagrams, one for a single convex lens and the other for a single concave lens, are joined one above the other. The diagram presents these two lenses in a specific discussion uh, and the, uh, of the different function of each of these lenses. The one corrects nearsightedness and the other farsightedness. This is not a lame attempt to take credit of the invention, but an attempt to eliminate the fact that in the, the optics, Kepler assumes that after being refracted through one lens, the rays of light fall on a screen to form a picture, which is the culmination of the visual process and the subject matter for the higher faculties. In the telescope, however, after being refracted through a single lens, the rays of light that would have produced an image or a picture at this point are refracted again through another lens to eventually produce an image in the observer eye or on a screen. In this sense, the distinction Kepler has attempted to establish between the virtual image and the picture collapses between the two <clears throat> lenses of the telescope, light carries visual information of a potential virtual image that is then transformed into a material picture. Thus, instead of reinstating the retinal picture as the culmination of the visual process, he hands his suggestions for improving the new instrument, not with a complete picture on the retina, but after being refracted by the crystalline lens, they will find the point of convergence on the retina itself. This is the definition of clear vision. So only after being refracted twice, then through the crystalline lens, only then it will become a retinal uh, picture. Replacing an ontological distinction between image and picture with a technically determined geometrically, geometrically conceived point. In order to, under to understand why this change was perceived by Kepler to be so crucial, Okay. Uh, that it de demanded such an awkward, uh, such awkward efforts to cover it up, I will suggest that it represented for him a paradigmatic shift from a world of physically induced shadows to a new visual economy. 
wholly governed by the geometry of refracted rays of light. It was a shift from the Renaissance fascination with perspicuity and, it, and its opposite, uh, opposite uh, with shadows and opaqueness to a Baroque world where such dichotomies collapsed and only artificially manipulated refractions remain. Uh, so let's start with the uh, Alberti. In his Della Pittura, posited complete transparency as the ideal of perfected visual experience. A painting was the embodiment of a transparent plane bisecting the, py the pyramid of sight provided the viewer with an almost uninterrupted visual experience of an alternative and beautifully and beautiful reality that is well proportioned reality. Thus the painter was able to dissolve the opaque surface, transforming it into a transparent window. Uh, following uh, that, the painters uh, were fascinated with Alberti, also uh, uh, developed another line of uh, investigation uh, and turned to examine the relationship between transparency and its opposites, the opaque surfaces and the shadows they cast. In their attempt to conceive transparency, these two modes of painterly investigation undermined Alberti's window. Conceiving the painted surface as a mirror paved the way to playful distortions, as, as well as questioning the epistemological value of the painted image as a mere secondary copy of reality, while investigating shadows exhibited the dichotomy between shadows and transparency, that it's just a relative, and gradual with no well-defined endpoints uh, uh, of complete darkness or complete perspicuity. Leonardo da Vinci, uh, fascination, fascinating investigation of shadows and the projection uh, through a pinhole ends not with a clear demarcation lines, uh, not with clear demarcation lines between the dark and opaque and the transparent, but with a playful variety of shadowy shapes and their complex interactions informing pictorial depictions. Remember, O oh painter, that the varieties of light and shade in the same species of tree will be relative to the rarity and density of all branching. All these minute changes are blurred at a distance and thus the celebrated sense of vision find it difficult to recognize the parts in that they make a confused mixture which partakes more of that which predominates. The attempt uh, to see as if through a transparent window and to capture nature as is seems doomed to fail since in addition to the various optical transformation, nature exhibits an astonishing variety of forms. You imitator of nature, be careful to attend to the variety of configurations of things. In his 1604 treatise on optics, Kepler thoroughly criticized the notion of trans transparency rejecting the Aristotelian need for a transparent medium as communicator of visual data or as the carrier of visual rays. Uh, Kepler eliminates Renaissance frustration at reading complete transparency and instead institutes light and the shadows it projects on an opaque screen as the necessary mediator between visual reality and human mental faculties. Kepler's camera obscura with its fast, uh, flickering shadowy apparitions on a wall or a screen replaced Alberti's window and its insistent demand to see. Yet Kepler preserved the Renaissance challenge to clearly differentiate between virtual images and some authentic visual experience of the physical world. Instead of the medieval and Renaissance emphasis on immediacy versus mediated experiences, Kepler set the demarcation line on the difference between images that have no physical existence, fluttering in mid-air or in a mirror, and pictures that are physically projected on a solid screen, whether a paper or a wall. It was, <clears throat> it was this distinction that for Kepler the telescope undermined. In the conversation, Kepler attempted to blur this failed distinction but a year later, after examining a telescope and observing through its lenses celestial phenomena, <clears throat> he tackled this issue in his Dioptriche. Just a second. 
uh, one can still feel certain unease. And in the letter of dedication, Kepler still asserts that this treatise is but a clarification of some obscurities in the optics from 1604. And I quote, indeed, because some have judged my discussion of this matter in the optics to be obscure, <clears throat> the blame is with the teacher and not with the sluggish abilities of the many. Notwithstanding this manner of preserving, presenting his text as a continuation ex and explication of research program into optical issues, the shifting of certain implicit and marginal notion in the 1604 optics to the core of the explanation of the telescope turns the optiche into a truly revolutionary treatise. Um, just, uh, I'll jump just. Now, what happened? Sorry. Okay, that's what I was saying. Um, the, the 1604 treaty is opened with, this, with a somewhat lame apology for its transgressions of mixing mathematics with natural philosophy. That's the opening sentence of uh, Ad Vitalione. Albeit that since for the time being, we here verge away from geometry to a physical consideration our discussion will accordingly be somewhat freer and not everywhere assisted by diagrams and letters or bound by the chains of proof, but looser in its conjectures. We'll pursue a certain freedom in philosophizing. Despite this, I shall exert myself, if it can be done, to see that even this part be divided into propositions. <clears throat> uh, the Diopter chain contrast boldly declares that it is a mathematical treatise and that mathematics is the chief tool in any philosophical investigation. I present you, dear reader, a mathematical book. Indeed, comprehending this is not easy, and it requires not only ingenuity in the reader, but principally attention and an exceptional desire to know the causes of things. The only way to fulfill the reader's desire to know the causes of things, that is the law that govern physical processes, is by following the mathematical exposition. The optician then proceed with a clear declaration of inventing a new science. Um, since the, uh, Euclidean optics has classified catoptrics as species of optics concerned with the reflection of a ray of light, in following this example, this small book of mine is named at its birth, the optic, because it discusses principally the rays refracted by transparent and dense media process that is taking place naturally in the human eye, just as artificially in various lenses. Dioptric comes first, catoptric comes following for the reason that catoptric discusses images and what they are, are ex uh, when what they are exactly cannot be understood without asking for the knowledge of the eye from dioptric. So suddenly the optic, which was in the medieval tradition, was uh, the last uh, part of optics, the less epistemologically uh, uh, safe and certain. Uh, it, it talks uh, illusions and uh, refraction, etc. Suddenly that becomes the main, the, the basic part of uh, optics. Um, the emphasis is shifting from the camera obscura as a model for the human eye to the equivalence between the human eye and the telescope, a system of producing refracted images through a lens. Moreover, the whole structure of the discipline of optics is rearranged in the classical and medieval hierarchy. Simple direct vision as basic phenomena was the basic phenomena to be discussed, as basic phenomena to be discussed comes first and only then artificial modes of producing images by reflecting surfaces and lastly, through refraction. The principle arranging this hierarchy is the epistemological value of the visual experience. Direct vision as an immediacy and correctness does convey the visual object as is. Reflected images is in John Peckham's words, merely the appearance of an object outside its place. Uh, the uh, refracted image is distorted and baffles the senses 
the sense of sight with fantastic chimeras. In 1613, the Jesuit scholar uh, Franciscus uh, Avilon, Avilonius most emphatically reaffirmed traditional hierarchy of sight. And I quote, all the things that are contained in optics are considered under, the triple, under a triple reason, compared to the triple modes through which creature come to know God. First, direct vision, that is our eye, as it turns towards the thing in front of it. So it is compared to the cognition of the minds of the blessed, contemplating the presence of God, as St. Paul said, face to face. The second part is reflection, that is the perception of those things whose images come back to us from mirrors. This is not unlike that cognition that through faith we see God in the created things as in a kind of mirror or in enigma, enigmas. Thence the third that we call infraction. This is how the species of things are transmitted through dissimilar diaphanous uh, media. And from them, the species enter the eye as if deformed and fractured. Thus, some of the divinatory notions of the heathens, corrupted by many errors, are affected by the light of nature only. Kepler's new science of Diotric rejected this hierarchy altogether. The notion of direct vision disappears and is equated with the deformed and fractured images produced by refracting lenses. Reflections and mirror are then subsumes a special case of refraction. Implied, implied in this scheme is that optics in and of itself is now an overarching science of light, whereas vision is only integrated into a discussion over specific manipulations of rays of light by refracting and reflecting surfaces. Uh, I'll skip a little bit. Um, the shifting of artificially induced refractions to the center of the science of optics finds an immediate expression in the treatise itself, in its critique of former mathematicians and in its structure and its in, particular, and in the particularities of some of its proposition. In this case, Kepler rejects Renaissance ideal of transparency, not by replacing it with the uninterrupted flow of light through a pinhole, but with the new powerful ability to manipulate light through a system of lenses. Transparency is thus reje rejected, not in the name of opacity, but for the fact that light is continually refracted through the universe. This is what at stake in Kepler's thorough criticism of Johannes Pena's introduction to Euclid's op Optica and Catoptric uh, Catoptrica from 1557. Uh, Pena relying on Gemma Frisius observation that did not detect any refraction of rays arriving from the stars, conclude that there is no ether in the heavens and that the same air that surrounds the earth fills the distances between the stars. While Kepler commends Pena's application of optics to astronomical questions, he rejects Pena's conclusion on account of the latter disregards to the physical aspects of the optical phenomena, but especially because his traditional understanding of refraction as an obstacle to clear perception but especially because the understanding of refraction is an obstacle to uh, perception. Um, and instead of the uninterrupted flow of straight rays of light as the common and basic optical phenomena, in the optiche, the ray of light is always disturbed, distorted from the, its straight path and is constantly manipulated. Following this Keplerian insight concerning the ubiquity of refractions, uh, can explain some of the peculiarities of the optiche, especially in comparison with Kepler's 1604 treatise on optics. Kepler aspires to establish his scientific investigation of both astronomy and optics in an a priori principles. He ends the preface of his optics with a declaration that he intends to rewrite the whole of optical theory by giving pride of place to a priori reason. He dully opens the first chapter with an attempt to define common notions in uh, the manner of Euclidean geometry as the only complete example of a priori knowledge. The failure of this attempt ends with Kepler's reluctant comment that lacking a rigorous definition, he follows the convention of the optical writers, admitting that in, the, uh, in this case, our discussion will accordingly be somewhat freer 
and not everywhere assisted by diagram, etc., as I quoted before. In the Diopti check, Kepler attempts to rectify this failure and suggest a new mode of integrating the rigor, <clears throat> integrating the rigor of mathematical reasoning with empirical significance. Accordingly, the treatise's first move is a definition, but in contrast to Euclid's elements, this definition does not present the reader with an object, such as a point or a line, but with inclination, as a relation between a ray and a geometrical line. Inclination over a surface is assumed to be about an angle between a perpendicular to the surface and whichever other ray that the perpendicular cuts at the point of the, on the surface. Establishing this relation as a point of departure replaces static contemplation of geometrical object with constant motion that forms and reforms a quantitative relationship between a perpendicular to a certain point on a, an unspecified surface and a ray of light hitting that point. And that there are many rays of light falling in simultaneously on that point, each ray is inclined to that surface differently. Now this definition is followed by two optical axioms and uh, that uh, establish the direction of this motion. And after um, he uh, establishes uh, the inclination and the direction, uh, he comes to define uh, what is refraction, the subject of his, of his new science. But that, is not in, but that is not possible as it involves both a geometrical aspect and a physical effect, another optical axi axiom will not do the job as refraction involves more than the phenomenal description and is the relationship between the inclination and the physical density of the refracting surface. Instead, Kepler suggests an operational procedure that sets the stage for the appearance of refraction through a manipulator's ability to artificially measure its value. This is done not as part of a rigorous system of deductions, but as a problem, problema, whose solution is a practical matter and not a theoretical consideration. Uh, I will skip uh, the, the description. He puts a, a, a cube of a glass uh, in a, a wooden box and then measures the shadows of the rays of light that falls through the box and so that it determines the angle of refraction. So actually what he does is translating shadows into refractions. And this act of translating shadows projected inside, uh, the, and as we see, and that kind of goes through the first part of the treatise uh, until uh, proposition uh, 14, uh, where you uh, uh, project uh, 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 shadows uh, uh, against the sun. Um, the introduction of lenses as a device to manipulate the activity of light transformed Kepler's theory of vision. The dichotomy so essential to his optics of 1604 between image and a picture is blurred in the Diopticha, where instead of emphasizing the passivity of pictorial representation, Kepler defines pictura with active verbal form as a penetrating passion. This nuance provides Kepler with a framework to discuss the different properties of lenses in their relation to vision, where vision is no longer mere projection on a screen, but the result of a constant manipulation of light, and that the resulting picture is never secure, but always weavers between distinct and clear perception and blurred and confused images, depending on the operational and instrumental procedures. Light indeed is the active agent in the visual process, and the pencils of light draw pictures of visual reality on the retinal screen. But this activity is not one-sided and uninterrupted. Light is refracted and redirected by the various media it travels through and then by the crystalline humor before it falls on the retina. By adding lenses, the observer can manipulate light further, adjust it to produce different modes of accurate representations. After Kepler eliminated the observer from the visual uh, process in his optics, okay. <clears throat> he, he re uh, engages the observer as an active manipulator of the visual process 
in gaining new knowledge, not as an object of contemplation, but a process of producing new entities and a causal explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Raz. Uh, the floor is open for questions and comments. Uh, maybe I'll have a question for uh, Orna and maybe that will uh, clarify certain uh, uncertainties I have about Aristotle uh, and how unified his theory of vision because as you presented you tried to kind of make a coherent or at least several options and I've at least through some of the medieval commentator and I, uh, I read, uh, they kind of see, they, they take it not as a coherent uh, picture. They see, I think Nicola Rem says something like, uh, in the Meteorologica, uh, Aristotle talks like the ancient and he's wrong. And in the Anima, he talks like the modern and he's correct. Uh, so how unified is this, the sensu, the meteorologic, the meteorology, the Anima, does, does, is there like a uni, unified theory of vision or is it something that uh, Aristotle uses according to the matter at hand, the, the problem ad hoc kind of problem that he's facing? Yes, well, I don't think that there is a unified theory of vision. It's uh, the difference between the visual ray theory that appears in the Kylo, the Meteorologica, is very different from, uh, from the theories that we find in the psychological writings. But we do see a gradual change in Aristotle's uh, uh, attitude to the visual ray theory. It's, uh, in certain places, he just uses it. In others, he says, well, it doesn't make any difference if we assume this theory or the other, other theory, that uh, the objects affect, uh, affect the medium and the medium affect us. Then in the, the anima, he, he hesitates more. And in the sensu, he uh, took completely, in chapter two of the sensu, he completely dismisses it as absurd. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a gradual uh, development in Aristotle's uh, um, um, acceptance of the visual ray theory uh, from the Kylo de Meteorologica, uh, and it ends in the sensu, where he, he completely dismisses it. So, the, the, but there are two theories, and they are incompatible. But but then, is it like a development of his thought, or is it like? Because I have a feeling like in the meteorological, the meteor meteorology kind of give us a, there's an ad hoc solution to the rainbow. So he has to talk about visual ray. What can I do? Something like uh, he says in a physics uh, book two, chapter two, where, well, in optics, we have to sort of imagine that these lines have a physical uh, meaning, significance. Uh, or is it something that is a development? Is it like kind of, I, I have an optical problem like the rainbow, so I use what the opticians uh, say, or, or is it something that is, uh, as Aristotle sort of evolved, he uh, rejected the, uh, the visual ray theory completely? Well, I, ca I can't say for sure because we can't um, have a clear chronological order of Aristotle's writings, but my picture of this uh, thing is that it's a, it's a gradual development. I think that in the Meteorologica, in certain passages in the Kylo, he, he believes in the visual ray theory. He, he thinks that it is effect, effective. But, uh, he, and then he gradually suspects uh, it not for, for its uh, explanatory merits, but for other concerns. One of them is the one I mentioned about Empedocles, that it seems to him unlikely that uh, um, light will travel such a vast uh, distance without uh, this motion being observed. The other the problem that he raises in the Anima 2.8, uh, he says that uh, the, his predecessors uh, reduce all uh, per perception to contact. And the visual ray theory is, uh, is uh, open to discharge because again, it's contact between the visual ray and the eye. So he had these concerns uh, at the background 
And I think that gradually he understood. The, the, so then there is the middle point where he says, okay, we have this theory and that theory. And for explanatory purposes, it doesn't matter which theory we choose. And then at the end, uh, he realized that he can do without the visual ray theory and uh, have his uh, qualitative change theory that he presents in the De Anima and then in a more developed way in the Descenso. That's my uh, assumption. But, uh, you know, I Thanks. Yeah, Saul. I have a, a question for, for, for us, uh, just if for more clarification. If I understood correctly, the, the change that you describe in Kepler's views are due to, due to the telescope. So in the sense that he arrived to them because he had to explain the new the, the new phenomena in the sense the the new device or is it also something more internal in the way of his uh, thinking before he saw the telescope uh, my my suggestion is that the telescope is the is the a point of change it's kind of disrupt or uh, destabilizes his uh, former synthesis uh, because the moment, because he really in the in, in chapter five of his uh, Ad Vitalionem, he, he goes to kind of make the, 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 the difference between uh, a virtual image uh, that you kind of uh, project in mid air and why does the eye cannot see it if we put a, a person in that point where the uh, image was projected that uh, he won't or she won't see it. Uh, so we kind of make this difference between the virtual image and the image on a screen. And for him, it's also sort of uh, differentiating between something which is completely fantastical, that is a projection of our inability to see completely all the details. We cannot see the point of reflection. We cannot see the refraction. So we kind of com complement uh, the situation with our calculation and we see something which has some sort of affinity with the object uh, uh, that appears in the mirror or through the, through the lens. The telescope challenges it because the virtual image that is between the two lenses then become a real picture in the eye. So what happened? How, this, how do I deal with this translation if before I had this sort of strict separation between a picture and image? And this, I think, some, is something that uh, Kepler needs to address. And then the Optriche, uh, he does so. And my dog really get excited by this point. Uh, so it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's could be seen as an example of the force of uh, experimental uh, practice or uh, Although, it's, the, all, all, yeah. although the telescope was not meant as an experiment, but it was also as an experiment. I think it, it is, a, and, and the Diopdice is a very experimental text. It is Kepler as an experimenter, which is something that usually we don't read about or is not discussed as, you know, it's not his image. He's the great mathematician, he's a rationalist, mystic sometimes, but we don't, but historians don't uh, discuss him as an experimenter. And the Diopdice, as like a, an experimental program. You define things through problema. You have these sort of general definitions and uh, axioms that kind of tell you something about the relationship of the world, the proportions and the relations in the world, like inclination. And then you need a problema to kind of embody it in, in material phenomena, which is an experimental procedure. And, and, and it works also that also the treaties with, between these uh, uh, definitions, axiom, propositions, and problema that uh, uh, turns it into a material, physical, uh, kind of re relates the mathematical aspects to, to, as a, into a, to a physical uh, phenomenon. And... More comments or questions? Uh, David. David, I don't see David. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. 
Um, yeah, just a comment because I found it very interesting hearing these two experts and talk about optical things. And um, I've often thought uh, in teaching the history of mathematics that, that optics is something that's extraordinarily important um, in different phases, it's obviously important. Um, so it's very interesting to see it in a more uh, contextualized historical setting. I mean, I don't know anything about Aristotle, so that's all totally new. Uh, his, his uh, you know, obviously the, the famous ancient theory of uh, rays that emanate from the eye and, and, and all that, uh, and reflection in hero and things like that I, were things I, I taught. Um, but at a certain point, um, optics is really exceedingly uh, central to, for example, the, the beginnings of the calculus and um, dioptrics and catoptrics and all of that um, are one of the main topics in, the, in uh, this text you always hear about L'Hopital, the allegedly first text in the calculus. <laughs> but people, when they mention L'Hopital, uh, you know, most, most texts don't get beyond L'Hopital's rule or whatever. They don't, they don't really look into the fact that in fact, these mathematical problems about reflection and refraction were one of the biggest motivating factors in, in uh, applications of the calculus to curvature problems, things that Kepler and Descartes obviously thought about, but now you have people like Bernoulli who can actually work these things out. And, um, I just think it's a it's a, a fascinating thing and ought to play a much bigger role in our larger picture of how uh, mathematics develops. That many of the methods uh, are embedded in in questions that were long of long standing uh, in in optics, but these these things uh, disappear in the typical presentations that uh, that you read the secondary literature. So I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, it's quite fascinating to see these two different, hear these two different talks uh, going into detail about it. Thank you. I, just a, a small uh, comment of my own. I'm not an historian of the calculus, so uh, luckily for everybody. Um, but uh, you could see this kind of the way that optical problems uh, pushed Kepler to, to the, the edge of his mathematical uh, uh, ingenuity, uh, where he talks about uh, conic uh, sections and really kind of present in two pages in a concise way, uh, a whole new way to think about uh, conic sections and their relationship that he doesn't develop further, uh, but you could see already sort of the, the really the, the beginning of new ideas about uh, mathematical objects, uh, uh, turning them into some sort of a system and not just uh, objects that are uh, one after the other, uh, uh, generated through the plane bisecting a, a cone, but the, the system that kind of relates them all together, then you see sort of reverberation with uh, um, Laplace and others. So that's very interesting to think about it as the way that optics uh, pushes mathematics, uh, pure, more pure mathematics. Uh, Okay. Saptai, uh, you work both on uh, mathematics and on optics. Uh, nobody mentioned it that you made the uh, edition of Vitello. Uh, do you want to join in or do you listen? Now I am working on mathematical longevity. I uh, <laughs> changed my topic. Okay. 
Fair enough. So if there are no further comments, uh, we'll go for our break and uh, re-meet at uh, six o'clock in the afternoon, Israeli time, at the uh, time usually um, at which the research seminar takes place and ha have two concluding lectures and then a virtual uh, toast, okay? So see you all at uh, 18 o'clock local time. Yeah, and, and I mentioned to the virtual toast that everyone if didn't hear, if the, was not here at the previous uh, session, brings his own uh, wine or whatever drink you want and we'll have everybody with his own after session. So okay, Mr. and by the way, not only the wine, but if somebody wants to join after the lectures and address Shabtai, uh, then he's welcome to do so. Okay, see you all then. Thank you. אנחנו בהפסקה